All right. Good morning, everyone. We have a large crowd today, so I'm uh, enabling all of your mics one moment. If you do have questions throughout the meeting, just go ahead and raise your hand or interrupt me. We can go over specific items or features. We have quite a lot to cover in only one hour. This might go over. No big deal. You're more than welcome to leave. I'm not going to hold it against you. I won't be insulted either. All right, so I think I hit everyone's microphone. Um, you don't have to talk either. I'm not requiring that, so just heads up. All right, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. One second. Looks like we already have some people raising their hand. Yeah, go ahead, Ricardo. What do, what do you need? Can you guys hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Sorry, I think I clicked something by mistake. Uh, yeah, you happen. raised your hand. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I just want to bring up the chat. Uh, I'll and lower I think your I clicked. hand for you. Okay, sorry. Yep, no problem. All right, so if you guys were not um, understanding what this webinar is en uh, encompassing, this is our HMI software. This is the new software for assignment. This is Canvas. We have a new X panel that we released, um, you know, 4, 10, 7, 12, 15, you know, out of order. I, I mentioned it, but um, it's a Linux based processor. It has class one div two IP 68 on the seven inch. Um, we have a lot of other features that I'm going to go through as we casually um, stroll through this. But I just did, I do wanted to mention like what the hardware specs are. So with further ado, I'm going to begin the presentation. So, and just so you guys are aware, this is being actively recorded. So if you don't want to be on the microphone, don't speak. Um, everything audio included will be recorded and then it'll be posted upon our um, our social media page. So just keep that in mind as you communicate. If you don't want to be on it, don't talk. Um, all right, anyway, um, so let's go into unit one. What is an HMI? I'm sure everyone here knows what an HMI is. Um, I re-sculpted this presentation as kind of like a boot camp process to bring everyone from ground zero. I'll briefly go over that definition, but it's more of just like a formality. Um, communication between HMI and PLC, configuring the ethernet parameters, where is that found? If you're used to using the Simon's old X panel, you're using the legacy one, the Windows CE based one. Um, it's gonna be a little bit different when you're changing the ethernet parameters. And then adding password security, changing the theme to light and dark mode, because we know those um, users, we, they love dark mode. Um, I'm more of a fan of light mode, but um, I'll show you how to change those. And then we can create a new project and a page utilizing the graphic library. Um, all of our graphic library images are SVG, so vector-based images now. So you can change the size without ruining the quality. And then we're going to view the project in Canvas Simulator. So we offer two different types of simulators, and I'll show that to you in a moment. So let's begin. So what is an HMI? I'm going to leave this up for at least two seconds for the recording. This is the formal definition that I think that encompasses what an HMI is. Um, as you can see on the right-hand side, that's what, our, that's what our new X panel looks like. Um, it has a more of a rugged metal um, casing on the back end. Um, if you're familiar with red line, it's going to feel kind of hefty like a red line. That's the class one div two X panel. Um, we do offer a plastic base as well, which is going to be your non class one div two. So you don't, you're not stuck with a very heavy one if you don't want one. Um, just, just a heads up. All right. So. What is the purpose of an HMI? The purpose of the HMI is basically, you know, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, you're going to be talking to a field device of, of like, a, such as a PLC. Um, rarely will it be a standalone item. Um, I, I just don't see it. Maybe, like, maybe you might use it as a tablet. That's, un, like, that's unlikely. Uh, I don't see that happening. Um, maybe you're just using it to store recipes, but it's not talking anything. That's very unlikely as well. Um, most likely you're going to be using the HMI to talk to a PLC and that PLC is going to be talking to physical IO. Um, you're going to stream up that data, that um, those statuses or information metrics towards the HMI. It'll collect it, maybe historically track it, or you can use alarms, other features to cultivate that data and then send it to maybe the cloud or to a SCADA server. And that is right. We support cloud-based connectivity. 
I know a lot of people are afraid of using cloud servers within their automation setup, um, especially with, uh, you know, um, security, cybersecurity being an issue, but we do offer MQTT and we offer OPC UA to bridge that communication, that security gap between the HMI and maybe AWS or something of that nature. Okay. So just a reminder, Canvas is the software you're going to be looking at for the new Simon HMI, not XPanel Designer. That is our old XPanel software. The new software is called Canvas. And then the PLC software is called Psycon. Um, this presentation will briefly go over the PLC because I'm going to show you how to connect like our simulator from the PLC to the HMI. Okay, so... Um, the way to close the runtime remains the same from the old X panel going to the new one, the Linux based one, you're going to press the bottom left corner, then the bottom right corner, and then the top right corner. After you press those three, a dialog box will show up in the middle, and then you can exit out. Once you exit out, um, I don't think I have an image. Maybe I can open one up real quick. One second. I'll just go ahead and show you guys the process right now. I'm just opening up my Canvas software right now. We can load an image up real quick. Well, it looks like no X panels are loaded on the network right now, so I can't show you. Um, one second. All right, we'll come back to this item, but just to reiterate, it's bottom left corner, bottom right corner, top right corner, and then um, a dialog box will show up in the middle, and then you can go to settings, and then You'll notice that there are now two Ethernet ports where you can set the IP address for either one. So all of our new X panels will have two Ethernet ports, making them an ideal solution for edge of network um, features. So they can do edge computing and so forth. One can be for your LAN network. One can be for your WAN network if you want. So we'll come back to that. No worries. So how do you add a password to your program? So when you go, when you, when you create a new project, it should prompt you, do you want to make a project or do you want to make a password project, a project password, and, or you can go to file and then project properties. And then there's a project password right here and you can change it however you want. Now, if you want to erase the password from a project, enter in the current password and then just leave the last two fields blank, press okay, and that will remove the password. So you can provide, you can actually put a password on your HMI as well. So we provide the ability to put a password on the hardware and on the project itself. Um, this is what I was referring to by putting a password on your project. So you can lock down the settings. So the settings, I mean, this is a pretty good image of what I was talking about before. So when you exit the runtime, you'll be faced with two little icons, the canvas viewer or settings, and you would just press settings. And then you would come to this um, this section of the hardware. So then you'll see right here in network settings, that's where you're going to set the IP address. So you'll see two IP addresses. But towards the bottom, we see lock settings. So you can put a password on your settings so no one can go in there and tamper with um, the system time, the watchdog time, or the network settings. Anything cannot be tampered with when you lock down the settings unless you know the password. And then the same... Um, Method applies if you want to remove the password, put in the current password, leave the last two blank, and then press OK. We do have a factory reset option. Um, if you forget your password on the HMI, do not worry about that. Um, there is like a, a very long string. There is a very long string that um, you can enter as a one-time process to unlock the HMI that is only given to um, whoever, you know, assigned the password in the first place.
So it's kind of like a, a key, like a, a like a master key at that point. Okay, so changing from light mode to dark mode, I'm gonna move my software over here to make this more apparent. So changing from light to dark mode is pretty easy. You go to file and then you can go to designer settings and then you'll see under style, there's a theme where we can go from light to dark mode like this very easily. So it's just a new feature we offered. We thought people might want to look, uh, want more themes when they work. And technically we only offer two themes, but it's better than none or better than not being able to choose one, right? So uh, light and dark for there for you. And then, so creating new projects, pretty easy. I'm gonna to try to glance through these, these slides. These ones are pretty remedial. We'll get into more engrossing slides later. So file, new, you can create a new project or a new page this way, just using the file option. It does have hotkeys. If you're a hotkey person, just take advantage of those. So control shift in or control in. And then here, when you create the new project, you'll see at the very bottom, like I mentioned, you can put a password right there. It prompts it, it prompts you for the password. Um, you can either disable it or enable it. You can choose your screen size here where you're going to be saving your data or where you're gonna be saving your project, the project name, and then of course the width and the height of the project because you might be running it on your computer, who knows? Eventually we will allow you to have a runtime on your computer instead of dedicated to an HMI. So the image library is all SVG. It's all um, vector-based graph graphics. So let me open that back up real quick. So if I go into my image library, the graphic library at the top right, go into the image library here, you'll notice that like maybe when I click on button, which is something different than our previous software, right? We didn't have vector-based graphics. So when I drag this in, it keeps a pretty good quality and I can drag it or I can resize it and it pretty and it shapes to that um to that resolution pretty easily. So very nice quality when I change this. And it flips in any direction as well. And you can also rotate it. You can change the anchor point and rotate it there as well. So pretty nice feature right there, taking advantage of the whole rotation metric. Some software you have to actually export the image rotate it and paint and then bring it back in, which can be pretty cumbersome. So we provided this feature to reduce the engineering time. And then you can just reapply it. It will lock in right there on the anchor point will lock back in. And you'll notice that we provide a lot of graphics here. You can just drag and drop them in. Note to self, when you're importing PNGs or any type of graphic into your project, because you can import graphics, right? Like I could just copy this and paste it in. So I just copy and paste it, or I took a screenshot and I paste it into my project very easily. So just note to self, when you're using an image that you're importing, right? So I think it's edit or is it insert? I think it's, maybe I'm mistaken, hold on. Yeah, it's insert. So when you when you're inserting a graphic right from your computer, make sure that the the resolution is not bigger than the screen size. Um, most recently, I had to troubleshoot something like that. I think we're going to accommodate that in the future, where we automatically change the resolution for you. But if you're on a screen size that's 800 by 480, and you import a graphic that has a resolution of like 4,000 or 4K, right? Even though you're sizing it down, um, doesn't that doesn't change the resolution? So what we have to do is basically, you know, calculate the new resolution and it has to constantly do that. So when you're embedding new images into the project, make sure you're taking into account for resolution in the future. We will accommodate that by automatically um, calculating that for you within the designer. So um, just a heads up in turn, like if you start using the software and you notice something being slow, it's check the resolution of the image that you're importing. Um, other than that, we do offer a pretty robust library of images for you. Um, so you have like a little blower right there. Um, we have other industry standard images as well. Um, you know, you can look through the whole library at your leisure. I'm just, you know, casually gr uh, glancing through these right now. So maybe you have a printer and you want to print something, you allocate the printer icon, you press it and it prints the, the page, who knows? All right, so moving on. Oh, 
one more thing I wanted to talk about. So when we drag an image into the on the canvas, right, to the page, you'll notice at the bottom right and the top right, we have some options here. We have some um, parameters that we can change. So you can either change the name of the object. You can change the visibility based on a tag. So if you see this little chain link icon on the right hand side, and I'll mention this again, if you see the chain link icon on the right hand side, you can bind a tag to it. So like a digital tag or something of that nature. Um, and I'll show you that in a second here, but we can change the visibility, the opacity, whether it's blinking, how often it blinks, um, the X and Y parameter. So you can think of that like from people that are using the legacy software, you can think of that as like a horizontal move and a vertical move. Now you can just directly control the X and the Y, the width and the height, the rotation um, and all that fun stuff. And then of course you can assign actions over here. So we do offer pretty expedited actions. I'll go through that in a moment. So we have on press, on release, and then on double click as well. So if I wanted to change say, um, the size here, I could, right? And it will automatically apply over here. As you see, these are changing the width and the height. Also, if you notice that you can allocate tags to them. So that means you can dynamically change the position and the size of this within the project. So we'll go over how to create tags in a moment here. All right. So um, I briefly went over this. Don't worry about answering the questions. I'll give a five second pause. Maybe you might know the answer. You don't have to answer if you don't want to. But the number one question, I briefly I briefly went over this. How many IP addresses can be connected to the Linux X panel? So basically the question is asking how many ethernet ports does the new X panel have? And it has two. So I wanna emphasize that this device can now be used as an edge computing device. It can be used at the edge of network. So one for your local network, one for your LAN, WAN network, your wide area network. Now you don't have to use it in that workflow. You can definitely use both ethernet ports for two different LAN networks if you want, but both ethernet, ne or both ethernet ports cannot exist on the same LAN network. They have to be on two different gateways but you can use them both for a local area network if you need to. Number two, where can the properties be edited within Canvas? I just went through this. This was at the bottom right. We saw that appearance, transform, and action um, pane. And at the top right, we also saw the basic properties. So on the right-hand side, by default, you will see this is where you can change parameters. So up here at the top right, appearance, transform, and action. This is where you change the parameters of an object. Number three, can this Canvas simulator be interfaced with a PLC or a field device? I did not go over this yet, but just to answer the question, in the past, we did not allow this, but now we have provided something that we call an online simulator. So now you can use the simulator with PLC and like other devices on your network without committing to a purchase, right? So technically, um, we have two options here. I have an on, uh, I have a, a offline simulator which will allow me to use um, just like testing out logic, testing out button functionality, um, you know, offline properties. And then I have an online simulator over here that will last for 30 minutes. You can close it, reopen it, close it, reopen it to, you know, refresh that 30 minute window. But this will allow you to communicate to Modbus devices, other IO devices. If you need to talk to like an Allen Bradley PLC, if you need to talk to a Modbus device, like you can test it with the online simulator from your computer without needing our HMI, if that makes sense. And this is what's gonna to lead to us allowing to have the runtime exist on the computer in the future. You'll just probably need to buy a, a, like a, a virtual license or a dongle from us in the future. But yes, take advantage of the online simulator. It's free, um, you can just, launch it whenever you want like i am um, i guess i messed up with the momentary button or something like that let me go ahead and delete some stuff so you can just launch the online simulator without having to okay i guess the recipe is in here too oh it doesn't matter all right so notice how it just launched i mean there is an error we'll go through that don't worry um but it just it launches on its own you don't need to worry about purchasing anything prior to launching the online simulator so let me go ahead and delete some stuff real quick. I think it's this one. Let me delete this. And then script as well. 
All right, because we'll get to, we'll get to that eventually. All right. So jumping back into the presentation, can the Canvas simulator can the Canvas simulator be interfaced with a PLC or field device? Of course it can. We just went through that. So unit two, before we begin, are there any questions? If not, I will just continue. So the very basics, we're gonna learn how to create tags, right? A digital analog and string tag. We're gonna be able to display tag values and text. How do you get started? How do you display values? How do you create buttons? So that'll be the next one. We're gonna create a switch lamp object. I'm also gonna show you how to create a momentary button and then action button. So I'm gonna show you all the buttons that we have. And then number four, we're gonna utilize an entry data feature. So being able to create a keypad with your drawn objects. So like we're gonna show you, I'm gonna show you how to create a keypad with a text object so you can actually enter in values, not just read them. So read, write. And then we're gonna download the project to a Linux X panel. Um, assuming that there's one on the network. Yeah, we have one on the network now. All right, so something I did wanna show you guys, I'm gonna start the VNC. I have a VNC viewer right here. So this is the connection setup for canvas right now and notice how there is an x panel right here i can start the vnc server like this and then just launch it and then i'll see something like this right and then if i click the bottom left corner the bottom right corner and then the top right corner i can i get this little dialog box that i was talking about earlier i can exit and then you'll be faced with Canvas Viewer and Settings. You'll go to Settings. And then this is where you're going to be setting up the network settings. So like you can set up a domain, a name server, right? You can set up a LAN one IP address, or you can do DHCP, static or DHCP. You can do LAN two as well. And for those that have been using the X panel since the, you know, the previous one, the Windows CE one, you will remember that you had to connect over USB using Windows Mobile Device Center. You do not need to worry about that anymore. Um, we automatically treat the USB as a, another ethernet port, for example, but not for communication purposes, not for like IO device communication. This is just meant for like the PC to the HMI. You no longer need a third party program to connect over USB mini B. So that is a new quality of life feature that we introduced. So is as soon as you connect to the HMI, you can communicate with it over USB easily. So I'm going to go ahead and um, exit the VNC in one moment. All right, so we're going to begin with the digital analog and string tags. And then um, we're going to go into displaying tag values with text and all this fun stuff. So where do I go? At the bottom left, it kind of slaps you in the face. A little tag editor here at the bottom left. To create a tag, you just press add tag like this and then tag name. So you can call it whatever you want. I'm just gonna call it dig one. And then notice the data types that we offer. We offer Boolean. We now offer 64-bit data. I This has been a huge request in the past is like, do you support 64-bit protocols? Um, we do now. We definitely support it. We did not in the previous X panel, but um, we support the long data types now. So float 64. So just look at the number and that will tell you the, the data type that you're interested in. So like how many bits that data type has. And then last but not least, we offer string data as well. Yes, you can use this over a protocol. So if you need to talk to like a common protocol that has string data, um, like maybe like uh, OPC OA or something of that nature or MQTT, you can definitely use string data in that format. Um, there's very few protocols I, I can think of that actually have string data type. And maybe, I mean, I guess Ethernet IP does as well. So we do offer Ethernet IP, like standard Ethernet IP, not just the PLC one. So um, Ethernet IP, I think the standard is ODVA. So any of your remote IO, any of your Allen Bradley or other Ethernet IP devices out there, like if you're talking to an Omron PLC that has an Ethernet IP a driver, you can definitely talk to that over Ethernet IP and so forth and so forth. All right, so I'm just gonna leave this as Boolean. We're gonna leave it as a virtual tag. So notice that there's virtual and then like some other device that you can create. So we'll get into that in a second. Let me go in there and actually delete that. 
All right, so I have a digital tag. I want to make an analog tag now as well. So I'm going to make a integer. We're going to call it um, Anna one. And then I'm going to make a float tag. We're going to call it float one. And then I'm going to make a string tag, so string one. So relatively easy process, name the tag, assign the data type, assign the IO device if you've made one. There are some other parameters I do want to go through at the bottom here. So we invite, um, we incorporate encoding, a clamp method, a dead band, and a scaling. So the scaling behaves a little bit differently than in the past. So the scale mode in XPanel Designer was both a clamp and a scale together. We have segregated those features into their respective um, components, right? So with scaling, I could let this define, or I could let this define um, the scale, right? Zero to 100 maps onto zero to one. And I would still be able to accept a value outside of zero to 100 because I have not put a clamp on it because it's just, this is just defining the linear range. Um, it, it's not really a clamp. I, I want to like remind you guys about this. If you do want to clamp your raw low and your raw high, you want to go to the clamp and then maybe you clamp both and then you make this zero and a hundred. So something of that nature. So basically any value outside of zero and 100 will be rejected. Um, so that's, that would be how you like clamp your low and um, high for your raw. So I just want to like things changed a little bit from X panel designer to canvas. Um, pretty much that's all I really want. Oh no, there actually is some other cool stuff. So we offer a persistent value. Of course, this is last or retentive data um, value change. So you can have an action occur when the value of the tag changes, which is a pretty notable good feature. Um, this is from our SCADA software that we offered before. Um, it was like run tag action on value change. And then a new, completely new feature is we've expedited the way that you can commit to an action when the quality of communication has changed. So say you're communicating with a Modbus device and communication is lost, it's probably gonna cache that last value. So let's just say it's 500. But if the quality diminishes, you don't want to retain that value sometimes, that value of 500. Maybe you want to change the value to zero or something of that nature. You can now use the quality change feature to enact a, an, an action when you have an un, like unfavorable connection. So that would be that. Um, so I'm going to go back in here and remove the scaling and the clamp, press OK. So that was basically how to create a digital analog and string tag that should get you going in terms of creating a tag. Now, just take note that you can actually use our tags with Excel, like you can copy and paste back and forth. So I'm going to show that real quick. I'm going to create an unprecedented amount of analog tags. So Excel, open it up. And you'll know I have my worksheet here. I'm just going to paste that in. You'll notice that I just pasted it in. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of auditing because I don't want random numbers to increment on their own. And the reason I'm showing this is so you can create multiple tags very quickly. So you don't have to do it one by one. So this is this would be the way that you would make a lot of tags at once. So I'm going to go ahead and let's make like 372 tags, making sure the copy and paste worked it properly. All right, so we're gonna do it all, copy, go back into here, paste, it's asking me, do I want to overwrite the tag that I made before? We can just say, skip that one. 
And then the next 371 tags should paste. It might take a second because that's a lot of tags. It's going to take a second, yeah. And my computer is pretty slow. So one moment. All right, so just like that, in less than 30 seconds, I have over 300 tags created. Um, this also works for the IO address as well. So like if your IO address is sequential or you have some other way of, um, you know, expediting your IO addresses within Excel, you can do that. So you can just copy and paste everything over. This also allows you to adjust tags very quickly as well. So like you can copy and paste everything from here put it into Excel, make changes and copy and paste back and forth. So we do offer that capability. So I'm gonna jump back into the presentation. We're gonna close out of Excel. So it's just as easy as um, control C and control V, you know, your standard hotkeys for copy and paste. So we're going to introduce something called smart binding. So there's two ways to allocate a tag to a feature. You can either drag and drop the tag into the object, or you can drag and drop the tag into the field. So I'm going to create, let's see, I'm going to create an object. Let's create a text object. So I can either drag and drop this. So I want you guys to take note first. So over here in the text field, there's nothing there, just new text and a tag icon. So this chain link means that I can bind to it, right? So I'm going to drag and drop this into the, the text object and it automatically assigns to that parameter. So it will automatically always assign to the most widely used parameter of an object. So for instance, with the text object, it will allocate to the text um, field, right? It's not going to randomly allocate to the visibility or opacity, right? Um, if you have a switch lamp, something like this, the digital is going to allocate itself to the status up here. So the state. So if I unbind that, we can show that real quick again. So the state has a zero in it and I can drag and drop digital into the button and then we'll automatically allocate to the state. Now, if we look at other parameters over here, maybe I want to assign digital to visibility. So I can just drag and drop that into visibility. Or you can click on the tag link icon and then select a tag this way. You don't have to drag and drop. There's three different ways to assign a tag, right? Well, assuming that you're talking about the most widely used parameter of an object. So one, you can drag and drop the tag into the object. Two, you can drag and drop the tag into a parameter, right? So I can drag and drop this into the parameter of visibility if I want, or you can click on the chain link icon and assign it manually. So that's up to you. And we want to call this smart binding. So now I'm going to show you how to make a switch lamp, which is a pretty easy feature, right? Everyone pretty much uses this feature within their X panel or within their HMI. So the switch lamp object is right here in your toolbar, or it's in the insert dropdown. You can click on switch lamp like this, drag and drop it into existence. So I'm going to delete the other one I made. And then I'm going to assign the digital tag right here to the state. So it automatically assigns to the state. I'm going to go to the actions tab at the bottom right. We're going to go to the on press action dropdown, create new command add new command, change it from open page to toggle tag value, click on the tag parameter, choose dig one because that's what the state we assigned, select, press okay, and now we have made a switch lamp. So if we recall, this is visible only when digital one is on, so visibility, ditch one, It's if it's true, it'll be um, visible. So we can test it out with simulator real quick. But I think I need to change my starting page. One second. So 
So notice how there's no value over here because it's not visible. So when I change this, it becomes visible and the switch lamp object. So I'm just toggling this button and the value um, disappears or reappears. And then I can also change the value here as well. So pretty simple. That's how you make a text object, allocate an analog tag to it. This is how you make a switch lamp object and allocate a digital tag to it. Um, obviously you can do way more with this object is a switch lamp object. So you can have as many states as you want. Um, I think up to a certain, maybe, I think you can have like a hundred states or more. Like, I don't think that there's a, a realized maximum yet. So, I mean, if you have an analog tag and you have more than five states, you can definitely do that. Or if you have more than a hundred states, you can do that as well. Never seen it, but we can we allow for the um, the capability for it. Okay, so let's get back into the switch ramp object. Um, grouping objects together. So it's a very simple feature. I just want to show it real quick. So if I draw a square and I draw a circle, one second, James Perry, one second. I'm gonna bring both of these objects together. So right click, you'll see that there's a group feature or you can press control group or control G for group. So now it's a grouped object. They move together and you'll notice that the, um, in your project window, your project tree, it's called new group and you can select the individual objects. So I can select the individual object and move it and it stays part of the group. So it just extends the group. So you can change the individual, per, like you can change the individual objects. And if you want to, if you want to just click on an object inside of a group, you would do a double click. So we would call that a deep select. So I just double click and then I get my rectangle and it's still part of the group like that. And then to ungroup, you would just ungroup. All right. So James had a question. What was your question, James? Oh, sorry. I have a touch screen I accidentally uh, hit the ways in. Sorry, sorry, you have a touch screen. What was that? Oh, I accidentally hit the ways hand. I didn't need anything. Sorry about that. Oh, no, yeah, no problem, no problem. All right, so um, let's just begin. So that was a very simple feature, right? That That is what we called uh, grouping, very easy, right? So let's get back into the presentation. Okay, so we can create condition maps. I'm going to show this not with shapes, but with colors. I feel like it's... a better presentation with colors. So um, for appearance, we're gonna look at fill and then um, we're gonna make that based on parameter. So sometimes you will create your PLC project before your HMI project, like 90% of the time, most likely you'll, you will create your PLC project before your HMI project. And not always does the data flesh out properly. So like, for instance, um, in our previous software, you had to, like say like, oh, if the value is 23, change it to one so it can be green. If the value is 50, change it to two so it can be yellow. If the value is 123, change it to three so it can be green or red, right? But I'm here to show you that there's a simpler way of doing that. So if we look at the fill and I click on the little tag link icon over here, I can go to expression and then I can change it to a condition map. And I'm gonna select the tag and a one. And then when the condition is equal to 23, we'll say that it's green. When it's equal to 50, we'll say it's yellow. And then we'll add a condition. So when it's equal to 123, it's red. Anything in between will most likely just be white because there's no condition for the in-betweens. I didn't put that, I did that on purpose. Um, so I'm gonna press okay. And then I'm going to expedite one of our slides. So I'm gonna show you how to do an entry data tool. So like, a key, I'm gonna show you how to use a keypad tool right now. So let's recall this tag or this text object right here is displaying the value of Anna one, right? It's displaying this value because that's what we, allocated right here and a one. So I'm going to go to actions. I'm going to go to action drop down, new command, add new command, 
And then we're going to select enter tag value. We're going to choose the tag Anna one because that's the one that we're displaying. We're going to press select. And then you can change the header, the subheader, the position, um, the min and max if you want. So you can prevent people from using any number that's outside of this number. So let's just do 23 and 123. And then for header, we can call it Anna one. And then for subheader, we can say min 20. It might just say it on its own, but I'm just going to do this just in case. So we're going to do something of that nature. I'm going to press OK. So I'm going to press the, the play button, which is our simulator. And then we're going to display the value first, right? Because that's it was based on a visible parameter. I'm going to click on this, and then we see a keypad open up. So this is a generically pre-made keypad for you. You could expect the same type of keypad on your HMI. So I'm going to enter the value 23. Press Enter. It changes to green. I'm going to enter the value 24. It changes to white. I'm going to change it to 50. It'll be yellow. And I'll change it to one, two, three, it'll be red. And I'm gonna to try to enter the value one, but it's not gonna let me. And why is that? Because we set the minimum to be 23. And likewise, I can't enter a value greater than 123 because we set the maximum as well. All right, so that was condition mapping and keypad at the same time. So that's what this slide is referencing, creating a condition map. And then now I want to download this project to an X panel. So the methodology or the method, the workflow for that is pretty simple. You see this little share link icon. You'd click on that for connecting. Then you click on your X panel. It should show up here in your connection setup. If it does not, you can click add and then insert the IP address manually. But more often it should. So you're going to click on that. And if it doesn't, you can press the refresh icon as well. So you're going to click on your X panel. Press download from PLC or PC to HMI. It'll download just like that. We're gonna launch the VNC viewer because I wanna show you guys the results, of course. And it's loading, one second. So there we go. This is our project that got downloaded to that HMI I was VNC'd into earlier. So we notice that it behaves the same way as the simulator. I can enter a value. It does nothing to the circle. All right, one second. All right, I'm back. Sorry, I had to answer a phone call real quick. All right, so that was how I created a keypad, an entry data tool basically is what we're calling it. Um, we're using visibility, toggle buttons, condition maps, and downloading to an X panel. All of those features just got showcased. I think that's the, it for this unit. So let's ask some questions to, you know, or clarify what we went over. So, is a local ethernet connection required to connect with the, the X panel? No, you can use the USB mini B tool. You can use a USB flash drive to download a project. You can use an SD card to download a project. You can also upload a project these ways as well. You do not need an ethernet connection, but it makes things easier. That's up to you. So there's four ways to download a project and upload a project. You can do it via ethernet, USB mini B, USB flash drive, thumb drive, or SD card. Number two, what are the most commonly used objects in the HMI project? Well, I showed two of them. It was a text object and a switch lamp object. So recall that was how I was displaying the analog tag and that's how I was turning off and on that digital tag. And then number three, what data types does Canvas support? I asked this question to emphasize that we now support 64-bit data. So yes, of course, we support string, float, um, integer, u integer, and Boolean, but it wa I want to emphasize that we support, you know, 64-bit float, 64-bit integer, and 64-bit unsigned integer as well. So just make sure 
you remember that when you're thinking about protocols and who you're selecting for your HMI, we definitely support the 64-bit data communication with our protocols. All right. So we're not going to really do a lab that would take too much time. Um, we only have realistically 16 more minutes. So I'm going to jump into the next unit and show you how to do like page navigation, creating a basic script, using a trend graph, configuring alarms, and utilizing our new security feature called identity and access management. Um, I might not actually show it. I want to see something real quick because of how much time we have left. I might just want to talk about them. And if you're more interested in actually seeing the feature, like in real time, you want me to actually showcase it, please contact us at support at simoninc.com for a more intimate um, you know, session. We can have like individualized training of, of that nature. It doesn't have to all be done in this webinar. Now, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm only going to be glancing over the features that we offer here from here on out because we have 15 minutes left. So how do I create a button to navigate between pages, creating a script, a trend graph, configuring alarms, and utilizing the new security feature? So navigating between pages is the same way that we did toggling. So when I made that toggle button, you'll notice that the actions part, when you click on the drop down and you select your new command, open page is literally the first command that is being allocated to you know the command parameter by default open page will be there for you um yes jim brown i see that you raised your hand jim did i not allow you to talk oh maybe i need to allow these people to talk maybe that might help uh, all right, all ears, Jim Brown. I see that you're raising your hand. Maybe that might've been a misclick. That's another misclick. Okay, I will go ahead and lower your hand for you. All right, so um, yeah, so that's how you navigate between pages. It's pretty much set up by default. You just need to know where to look and that is in the actions tab. It, it pretty much hits you in the face. You create, an op you create an object, go to the actions pane and the first action already allocated is open page. And likewise, there's closed page right behind it, or right below it rather. All right, so we have three different buttons. I already went over one, um, which, which, which was the switch lamp object. Um, there's also an action button and a momentary button. So I, the reason that these buttons are useful is they show touch confirmation, because not always do you know that if you hit a button correctly, um, sometimes you're using a glove on your HMI, um, some people fat finger things. So now we offer another state that shows you touch confirmation. One second. Okay, sorry about that. Another phone call happened. Okay, so for momentary buttons, um, there is a third state. Typically with momentary buttons, you only have two states, right? You have an on and an off state. But for this one, we have a touch confirmation state because you know the, the IO device that you're talking to might be very far away. It might not show feedback right away. You don't even know if you touched it correctly. So then you, you, you hit the button again and you end up spamming the button unintentionally. So now we have a third state that when you press it, it will show you that you actually press the button. And then when you get a response from the IO device, it will illuminate. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into the software real quick. We're gonna draw that momentary button. And then I can kind of show you that you have an active state, an inactive state, and then a pressed state. So you have three different states for a Boolean object. So this is a Boolean object by default, right? Like a, it's a momentary button, it's off or on based on touch. So just wanna reiterate, we have a press state for touch confirmation. Now for action button, it's a pretty unsophisticated button, but it does the same thing. It's pressed and unpressed. So it gives you touch confirmation basically. 
And what it's meant to do, it can be like a page navigation button. So basically you can go here, create new command, add new command. Uh, maybe I wanna click on home, press okay. So now this is opening a page for me, right? It was very easy. It was already pre-allocated for you. So just wanted to reiterate that. So we're gonna move on now, if there's no questions. All right, so we have, I don't really wanna to get too deep into the sauce about this. We have global, command, uh, global commands and local commands. So global commands can be used by any object um, it will create in a very exhaustive list if you create a lot of global commands. And then local commands are, you know, they're respective to the object you made them on. They will only ever be seen by that object. So you don't end up with a bunch of duplicate um, commands all over the place, right? So just keep in mind when you're creating objects, you can do our global versus local. So you'll even see local right here. So I can change it to global right here, and then I can make a command. And then that one will be global. So then every object can see new command. All right, like I said, I don't wanna to spend too much time on that. Um, trend graphs have been, they're, they're much easier to work with now than they were in XPanel Designer. I love our new trend objects. So I can take the trend object like this, draw it into existence, I can drag and drop a tag into the, the trend like this. Notice how it already got allocated. I can drag another one, another one, and another one. You can have up to 32 pins in a trend graph. I don't know how quite useful that is, but um, you can do it. Also, you see these little markers right here. You can click on them to um, basically hide the pin from the trend graph when you're looking at a certain um, other, like when you're looking at other pins. So it creates that whole visibility um, invisibility parameter for the pins. So you can also make your um, trend graph bare bone. If you don't want anything there, you just want to see lines, you can do that. Or you can just show certain parameters. Again, that's at the bottom right in the appearance tab. You can show the configuration. You can actually bind tags to this as well. So this can be coupled pretty well with a security feature. So say like, you you don't want the controls to show when no one like when like um, a lay user is using the X panel, but when the engineer or the CEO logs in um, to the you know the security parameter, like the controls will automatically show up because of the boolean value went uh, true. Then you can save the trend graph historically. Um, you can change stuff. Um, you can change like what window you're looking at right historically, or you can you know, go, you know, you can just change what, what date time you're looking at. And then when you log out, it will just disappear like that. You don't have to show all of this stuff if you don't want to. I think there's one I really don't want to show. Like if you want to not, if you don't want to show the tag values, you don't have to show the tag values, right? So just, I think that's another misclick, Jim. I'm just going to assume it is. Um, go ahead and correct me if I'm wrong. All right. Um, so that's trend graph in a nutshell. Nothing too fancy other than um, we give you a lot more versatility with the object. Alarms, pretty pretty simple feature. You click on the little alarm icon right here, an alarm editor. You can add an alarm like this. So you can create the trigger. Uh, maybe I want analog or Anna one to be in my alarm. And when it's equal to 12, I want um, some action to occur. Maybe I have, maybe this action will occur when the alarm goes off um, or, you know, it shows up in the alarm history window. I think this one right here. So this is our alarm history. It'll show up here. Um, we have three alarm tabs. We have active, shelved, and historically. So just like grossly speaking, shelved alarms is kind of like your snooze button on your phone when you're waking up in the morning. Like the alarm is still active, you just don't see it. And it will hit you again in like 10 minutes or five minutes, whatever you set the snooze to be. Um, you can disable that if you want by over here in the alarm summary tab or pane. I can just disable that so you don't see it. You can also display or turn off historical if you want as well, like that. Um, just like the trend graph, you can disable a lot of stuff like this, make it very bare bone or you can make it based off of a logging in, you know, like a security feature. So that's alarming. Um, it also is, it's a historical as well. So you can save it 
to a CSV if you need to, if you want. Um, we also can track like if someone's deleting alarms um, nefariously, right? So maybe an alarm occurred while they were sleeping on the job. Um, they wanted to delete it so no one would catch them. If you generate the CSV file, it will catch that something was deleted and it will also catch what the value was before it was deleted too. So there's a lot of cool features that we offer in the X panel. Um, identity and access management, I'm not gonna go into too much detail. It's our security feature. So we can lock people out of objects or we can lock them out of certain um, features in the X panel. So you create permissions, you create users, and then you assign those permissions to di distinct objects or distinct features. And you can actually um, manage the users from the HMI. You don't need to go back to the project, manage them, and then re-download it. You can do user management from the X panel itself. Um, so I'm gonna, all right, so to couple the security feature, you do need to create a login window and a logout button. Um, it depends on how you want to create it, right? There's many ways to incorporate this feature, but this is like the bare bone way. We This is like the expedited way that we um, generate for you. So in the actions dropdown, like where you have open page and toggle tag value, if you scroll down, you'll see open logon window and you'll see log out user as well. So you can assign those to two objects. Like I could essentially, where is my canvas? So I could create a square, go to the actions, or it's a rectangle, but I can create a rectangle, create new command, add a new command, and then scroll down to open logon window. And then I can press okay. And then I can create another rectangle, right? And I can go in here and I can create logout user. I think it's down here. Just like that. So now I have two buttons for my security. I have a login button and a log off button. All right, so unit four, I think we were gonna talk about, I'm just gonna briefly talk about the scripting. So we do offer scripting, right? We offer periodic, manual, or startup scripts. So basically as names imply, if you're using a startup script, as soon as the runtime initiates, it will begin. Uh, a manual script, you will need like a button or some type of other parameter that is launching the action of that script, or there's periodic, it will run every so often. And you can have it run every 10 milliseconds, every one millisecond. So now we offer millisecond based scanning if you need it. Um, it is JavaScript, uh, it's JavaScript ES5. And we give you some examples whenever you create a script. So how do you store a variable? How do you write to a tag? How do you read from a tag? How do you run another script? So that though, like we just give you like the very basics of what you need to start writing a script. If you need more documentation, you can look at the help file or you can visit the encyclopedia for, or the Wikipedia, or the, you know, I guess the scripting encyclopedia for JavaScript ES5, um, because we basically imported their scripting engine so what that means is if you don't want, if you're not a, a, a scripting savant, right? A scripting guru, you can just go to Stack Overflow and copy someone else's work and then paste it into our JavaScript um, engine and it will work. Uh, I have, I've had to do this before, like creating a random number or something like that. Um, so it's very easy to just copy and paste from Stack Overflow. Uh, we're gonna skip over this because there's more features to talk about. So we support while and do while, if you know what those mean, if you don't, um, stay tuned for like the help file or like just looking at the slide because I will be sending this recording out. You can revisit the, the recording and read this thoroughly, or you can send in a question via um, email and I'll be able to answer it more thoroughly for you. So we support while and do while, we support if else, of course, for loops, switch case, we support user-defined functions as well. This is not the same thing as importing your own um, library. You cannot import your own scripting library, but you can define functions yourself within the, the scripting engine, right? So this is much different than importing your own library. I've been asked that many times. You cannot do that. 
Um, we have try catch. We support that as well. And then some other scripting functions that you might find useful. Notif Notification.send, that's a good way of troubleshooting your HMI. Um, you can put that within your script to debug it. Um, Thread.sleep and thread.msleep. I definitely want to talk about these because if you're used to using our old X panel, the sleep instruction was always exclusively in milliseconds. Now we have sleep and M sleep. So M sleep, of course, you might have guessed it is milliseconds. And then sleep is in seconds. So just make sure you keep that in mind when you're choosing the sleep. Because I've had people choose thread.sleep because they're used to the old X panel and they put 1000 in there. That means it will sleep for a thousand seconds. So probably not something you wanted. You, you were probably meaning a thousand milliseconds and you meant to choose M sleep. Um, there's system.exit to get out of the runtime without using the three corner method, um, importing a script or running a script. All right, so connecting a Linux X panel to a PLC, um, we'll do that last. I'll, that'll be like, if no one, you know, I'll do that after I talk about some more stuff. So yes, our X panel does support recipes. We have every historian feature that you're looking for. We have data logging, trending, um, alarms. You can create CSVs from these. It also stores to your USB flash drive, to your, to your SD card, to the X panel itself, or we support FTP um, protocol, right? So Frank, um, Tango, what is that? Piano. So FTP. So we support that protocol as well. And then in mentioning, we also support NTP. So Nancy, Tango, Piano as well. So like that's uh, that's the time protocol that you, you can sync to like a time protocol on your server. And it's responsible for knowing like the global time and your HMI can sync to that device. All right, so we're gonna skip over interfacing with a PLC for right now. So we do support recipes, just letting you know, you can import, export CSV. Um, for those that don't know what a recipe is, basically your cal you can either, um, it's kind of like a cookbook, right? You have a, you have a different permutation of your ingredients that, um, you, that you are using to calibrate your machine properly. So like, Maybe when you want to create widget one, you have a, a different permutation of your um, ingredients. And when you want to create widget two, a different, permuta a different permutation, and then widget three and so forth and so forth. <clears throat> also, because that, that's when you're going to send data to the PLC. So maybe you calibrate your machine manually, and then you find out the distinct values that make it run optimally manually. And then you can also retrieve those values from your field IO and then store that as a recipe. So you will always know the perfect permutation for your application. So that's another way to utilize recipe. Um, data logging, I think everyone is familiar with data logging. Um, that's a pretty generic feature for an HMI, right? Like if an HMI is not acting as a historian, then it's probably in an airplane showing you movies. Um, but yeah, no, our HMIs are definitely historical um, or they definitely support all the historian features that you're looking for. Um, we can do periodic, um, manual, startup, tag value change, all the fun stuff. Um, this is an example of what the CSV is going to look like for data logging. Um, it is 901 or it's a minute after what was promised for this webinar. Um, you're more than welcome to leave. I won't be offended, but I'm going to keep going to finish off the rest of the, the seminar. But um, just, uh, and thank you guys for showing up for those that do leave. All right, so this is what the CSV will look like when you're generating it from, this, um, from the data log, by the way. So it's pretty easy. It'll be the name of the data log. It'll be the timestamp, the name of um, the tag, and then the name of the tag. So like, this what these are string tags and then these are value tags, right? So these are analog tags, just a heads up. So these, the, these headers are just like the tag names themselves. All right, so we're gonna skip that lap. So I wanna talk about this specifically. These are the really cool features. If you did stick around, you're gonna learn some cool things. So audit logging, what does that mean? We provide an audit trail, which is good for CFR 21 part 11. You heard that correct. Our HMI supports CFR 21 part 11. So that's an audit trail and most respectively, it's used for pharmaceutical and the food industry. That is your FDA compliance, right? So CFR 21 part 11, just remember that string. 
We support it with our audit trailing. Um, it's a pretty new feature that we didn't support before. Or it's a compliance that we're conforming to that we did not um, before. So when you're in a hospital and a nurse is trying to grab like medication from the kiosk, they use audit trailing. They use um, electronic signatures. And that is something that we provide now too. So technically our HMIs could be used in a hospital setting or in food industry. Um, we offer scheduling. That's a pretty standard feature. You can tell the HMI when to enact something. So if you need to save a data log every week, you can do that. Or if you need a certain action to begin at 7 a.m. every morning, you can do something like that. So we offer scheduling. So this is what the audit log feature looks like. Just want to reiterate. So like you can create this little over here or you can export it too. So it will track every single action on the HMI, who signed what, who did what, what got touched at what time. So a very perfect feature for CFR 21 part 11. And then you just export it to get that file. And you can't delete entries either. So the, the entries will stay for indefinitely. Um, scheduling. So this is what I, I just want to jump back to this feature. So you can schedule something to happen every day, every week, every month, um, every other day. It just depends. Like, um, kind of think of it like your irrigation system, right? Like you can schedule your irrigation to turn on or off whenever you need it to. So this is basically a scheduler feature. You can do, you can tell something to occur whenever you need it to. So SMTP, we support this, right? So what does that mean? That means that our HMI can send an email or text message. For those that don't know, you can actually send an email to a phone number and it will show up as a text message as long as the carrier supports that. So for my Verizon brothers, the domain at vtext.com, that is the domain for sending an email to a phone number. So for example, phone number at vtext.com, if I send an email to that, it will actually show up as a text message on your phone. So when I say that we support SMTP, I am saying that we support sending an email to other emails, of course, and sending an email to phone numbers if the carrier has a text domain, right? Or an email domain on their phone number. Most do. I know that for a fact, um, the, the US brands do. So like Verizon, T-Mobile, um, Cricket, all of them, they have, a, they have a domain that is supported with their phone number for emailing. Um, just know if you're using Google, like Gmail as your server, you will need to create something that is called an app password. Google recently stopped third-party access from using credentials. So you need to go into your Google account, go to the settings, um, go to security. It'll tell you to um, create a two-step verification and then it will randomly generate an app password for you. Copy and paste that and then put it into the password parameter in the project and then you're good to go. And then you wanna choose TLS uh, encryption 587 for the port number, and then boom. And you don't even, you can test this from the online simulator or you can test it from the designer. You can send the test email if you wanted to. Um, Multi-language, we support multi-language of course. So um, we support a lot of different fonts. If we don't support the font that you need for your language, so like, I don't know, maybe you're trying to translate to Chinese or something like that. And if we don't support the font that you're looking for, you can definitely import your own font. Um, just bear in mind, you might want to take into consideration copyright infringement when, when it comes to fonts. Um, sometimes that can be a thing. But no, we don't offer any um, fonts that would infringe on copyright. We offer all open source um, fonts. But you can always import your own fonts and you're on your own with that, of course can't give you legal advice, but um, yeah, you can change the different languages within the X panel. Um, obviously all translations will need to be done on your own. We are not like Google. We don't automatically translate for you. Um, this is pretty standard with any multi-language feature out there on the market. You will have to define your own um, translations. So this is just an example. If I click on English, 
it'll show colors one through five. If I click on Spanish, it will show these, or maybe this is French. I don't, I'm not French. I don't know French or Spanish really, but I think, um, well, the language will obviously change when you click on Spanish or French. And I think that is it. So um, that's all I wanted to talk about feature wise. Stick around for at least five more minutes and I will show you how to connect the online simulator of Canvas to the Sycon simulator. That's our PLC software. If not, you're more than welcome to leave. I appreciate you staying for this long um, and you're more than welcome to give me feedback. So I'm gonna send out a mass email. Everyone will be BCC'd, no worries. No emails are gonna be shared here. Um, you'll get a copy of the recording. You'll get a copy of the presentation. Feel free to give me feedback, please. I could use it. And then um, I look forward to, uh, you know, talking to you guys in the future. But I'm going to go ahead and show you how to connect two simulators together so you can actually test PLC logic and HMI logic together. So I'm going to open up Psycon software. That's our PLC software. And I might see some of you guys on Thursday for PID. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be a, a very um, engrossed presentation. We're gonna we're gonna definitely gonna hit the weeds with that. All right. So Psycon, new project, choose any PLC, press OK. And then we get a window like this to show up. I'm gonna right click on new program or pro program, create a new program. And then I'm just going to create a very basic rung. So I, when this contact is live, when it's energized, we will be energizing, or when it's true, we will be energizing the increase instruction and D0 will climb one for every scan that it's true. So it's going to grow very quickly because this is going to just be scanning. So I'm going to go online, connect option. Choose simulator, press OK. And then I don't, I don't know if you caught that, but our simulator uses the IP address of your computer. So 127.0.0.1. And then I'm going to link downloaded monitor the, to the simulator. Press OK. Press yes. So you'll have a simulator pop open like this, but that doesn't matter. Don't worry about that. I'm going to open up Psycon again. I'm just going to leave it the way it is right now, like this. And then I'm going to open up Canvas. I'm going to create an IO device. So it's very easy. You're going to click on this icon right here, open IO device editor. I'm going to create an Ethernet device. Notice all the protocols that we offer here. I'm just going to choose Simon PLC. Press OK. PLC yes. And then we have to make sure that we choose UDP. Um, the Psycon simulator does not support TCP. Um, I don't know why, it just doesn't. Of course, our PLC support TCP, but for Psycon simulator purposes, choose UDP. And then we're gonna use the IP address 127.0.0.1. And then I'm just gonna press okay, it's that simple. I'm gonna delete these boxes right here. I'm gonna create a text object. Okay. And we're going to put analog one into that object. I'm gonna go into the analog one tab. We're going to go to IO device. We're going to choose the PLCS protocol that we just made. We're going to go to IO device and then choose D00 because that was the value that we had, right? And then it's int 16. That was the value that we chose right here, D00. Now I'm going to go back into Canvas. I'm going to create a toggle button that's going to turn M10 off and on. So I'm going to go into the digital tag. I'm going to go to PLCS. I'm going to choose M10 and press OK. I'm going to drag and drop this into the lamp. And that's going to be the, sta the state of the object, dig one. I'm going to go to on press action, create new command, add new command. 
and then toggle tag value. Now we're going to run the online simulator. It has to be the online simulator, uh, online simulator. It cannot be the offline one. Otherwise it won't communicate. Now, if it doesn't work, you'll see red boxes, right? Red boxes will open up because that shows that like it's or red like crosses will show on top of your objects, meaning that you're not communicating properly. So that's one way to tr troubleshoot your project um, is to just make sure you don't have any red boxes. So when I click on this button, it should climb very, very quickly. So I'm going to open up Psycon and Canvas together so we can just see that. So it's climbing as fast as D0 is over here. And I turned on this contact, I can turn it off. So this is one way that you can test out our software without committing to any purchase. The software is complimentary. If you just go to simon.com, you go to support, download software, You'll see that the software is here for you, Canvas software. You can just download it right here. And then as well for Psycon, you can download it right here as well. So it's very easy to download our software. You will have to register with our website. It's free to register. You just create an account. And then um, after that, you can just download all of the literature or software that you need from us. And with that, now this webinar is officially done. Are there any questions before we dismiss? If not, I hope you guys have a great day. If you signed up for the PID presentation on Thursday, I look forward to seeing you there. Um, just note that the PID overview will be talking about our own PLC as the, the workflow. I'm not gonna be talking about VFDs or anything of that nature. I'm gonna be talking about our PLC and how to use our PID and basically what is PID essentially. So with that, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Look forward to the recording and the presentation coming your way.